my computer program is here. <laughs> and uh, thanks for everybody for coming out. Uh, I feel like I just come out of hibernation, even though I didn't get any rest while I was hibernating. I, don't know. Um, I guess uh, today I'll talk about a program I'm involved in with, with uh, SideCap and the software. And it's probably a little different from what you've heard here. Um, we call it results-based programming. And uh, so Maggie alluded to it a little bit on their grass banking with uh, the ranchers of Park, but it really is non-prescriptive. You know, it uh, has targets defined, as Maggie was uh, explaining. I think the targets that have been defined by uh, first by a Rancher Stewardship Alliance and then by PCAP, those targets are a little different than what the park has. But then being uh, ranchers whose main objective is grazing, we're going to have a different mandate than what the park does. So our objectives are a little different. Uh, for instance, uh, on the pipit uh, part of it, my personal backup, there's been uh, habitat targets developed for Sprague's pipit, sage grouse, flip box, uh, the northern leopard frog, loggerhead shrike, uh, I can't even remember. PCAP has developed quite a few. We're in the process of uh, developing more this year and hopefully the funding is available. We could do a couple of year and we work with uh, Canadian Wildlife Service uh, people who are the species experts and stuff. Unfortunately, and this is part of the problem as I see as a rancher within the program is they only recognize the sage grouse and the pipit for funding. And uh, when we're dealing with a multi-species action plan in this slot area and only having funding for a couple of species, I think uh, makes it actually harder on me because now I have to meet the habitat targets that uh, have been developed and across the ranch which uh, precludes my uh, adding the patchiness that might be needed. You know, if I'm shooting for all pipit targets, then uh, the long spurs probably get left out of the picture. Whereas if I could have, uh, you know, some long spur grazing, pipit grazing, I've got some sagebrush plots that we do measure, but uh, by only, you know, the environment counted only funding a couple of species kind of uh, reduces the effect a rancher can have. So, uh, like I say, my, my agreement is uh, with side cap held by stock growers, and it's for pipip, we do two. Uh, two transits for uh, sage grouse at my place and all the rest of it is for pipit and the sage grouse is just uh, more for an information thing it's not in the agreement just that there is habitat there that we're measuring it to see what's happening with it um, we've uh, Hey, we really get ahead here. <laughs> yeah, I guess, same thing like I was saying, we look at the plant height with the Robel pole, we look at the litter, our litter measurements are, our pipit are the same as the parks. I think our uh, Robel pole measurements are probably lower than theirs. And then we look at rain shelf, which takes into account uh, the grass species, the litter, the bare soil, 
and everything, and uh, we're shooting for a range health score of 75% or better, which is in the excellent range under the range health protocols. And there's another uh, kind of a hang-up, I guess, is all the range health measurements use the boards and stuff as a increaser, which means you don't want them. And if you have the boards and stuff, your range health is going to go down in score. And yet, when you're not probably okay for cattle, but when you're looking at species at risk, they need the boards because the boards are, uh, as Brad said, you see a lot more bugs on the flowers than you do on the grass stalks. So you want them boards because bugs are diet for a lot of these songbirds. So we, when we're looking at range health that was set up for cattle grazing, it doesn't correlate to species at risk uh, habitat needs. And that's where the patchiness and stuff comes in because as you graze pots out, bear it up, get rid of more of the litter, you're going to get more flowers, boards growing there years down the road. And so we're fighting each other a little bit in our uh, protocols on, uh, you know, exactly, you have to manage, you know, for one or the other, like the cows are the tool that I use and most of us would use to manage that grass to get it to where we want. And so you've got to uh, allow, the cows will make it patch or just let them go. But allowing them, you know, them patches to be recognized without hurting you within your program and uh, is, you know, something that we're missing in our, in our programming. Well, the economics would come into that, wouldn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah it's, well, in our program, it'd come in on either side. Well, that's, yeah. in, in the programming, if I miss one of the targets, I get a third less funding for the species at risk program. If I miss two of them, I'll uh, get two-thirds less. But on the other side, if I uh, run too few cows, I'm getting beat up at the market. Yeah. And that's going to hurt me. So it's a, you know, you have to balance. The other thing is, and I'm, as Caitlin has said, I've been involved in a lot of things, but uh, I do learn a little bit once in a while. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> There's, uh, um, you know, a whole bunch of uh, documents and stuff that people have put out describing, you know, right down to the minute details <coughs> of what the different species need. And very seldom do we capture all of that when we're trying to put together a booklet because it just gets mind-boggling. And one thing this winter, I uh, find out that the little 13-stripe gophers that have showed up after the real gophers disappear, I guess they prey on uh, pippet eggs and stuff. They're listed in a recovery measure or someplace as being uh, harmful to pippets. And I just thought they're a lot better than the other gophers because they don't make big mounds and stuff. But I guess maybe if I'm trying to raise pippets, Maybe they're not so much fun for me. And uh, all that, what they call research, and time reading and time spent trying to find out different things so you know what you're doing, or supposedly know what you're doing out there, all of that takes a lot of, a lot of time. It's management. It's a different sort of management than you're used to as a cowboy. And, uh, you know, you could be researching uh, new trail design or something down that line instead of finding out that gophers are eating birds and stuff like that. So, you know, all of that is a 
change in your thought process that uh, if you're going to get into these programming, you know, after you get going, don't be afraid to ask questions and if you see something that you don't think is working, you know, there's lots of, uh, lots of people around that uh, if they don't have the answer, they'll figure out where to find it. So, you know, you can, uh, there is a lot of help out there to, to you know, work through these programs. I guess uh, some of the, some of the challenges I see, and this is both from a rancher perspective and from being on some of the boards, but uh, try to get acceptance for a program like this. As I said at the beginning, it's new, it's different, it's not uh, prescriptive in any way. And I've heard over and over and over again that if you can't measure a change, there's really nothing there. And yet in a lot of instances, there's no reason for anybody to change. You know, you might have been doing it right all the all along and uh, then all of a sudden there's a species at risk act and there's more attention paid and yet you're already there and yet there's no, it's hard to make people accept that you shouldn't have to change to fit into the programming and a lot of the programming is that, you know, like Brad talked about the watering and this and that and uh, if it works for you, then programs are fine. I found I'm on right on the divide, north of Elmery, north and east, and uh, soil is pretty thin. You're into bedrock right away. They uh, run a grid road through there in 1967, dug a borrow pit for water on the side of the road that they cut off from the main pasture, and it'll hold water for two weeks in the spring because it just soaks away. But dugouts are no good. Yet in the programming in this province, the CAP programming they call it now, dams are specifically mentioned as not allowed. And it's an environmental program and I really haven't seen a beaver dig a dugout yet. <laughs> not sure, uh, you know, what the reasoning is there. And uh, so, you know, them are some of the challenges. They want to see you make changes, and sometimes that's the worst thing you could do to get the outcome they're looking for. Uh, of course, uh, the length of the programming is uh, restrictive. Brad was saying that they, uh, they go back every five years. And most of the funding we get here, maximum is five years, lots of it's three years, four years, some of it's yearly, you have to apply for every year, and that's not enough time on a ranch setting to, uh, to accomplish anything. You might get started, but you're never guaranteed that that funding is going to keep up, so if you've changed your whole management and then they change their mind to go somewhere else, you set yourself back farther. And just funding in general is, uh, you know, always iffy. And being on organizations, you're always chasing funding. A lot of the programs, like Brad said, there's maintenance on all the water systems and they pay 100% here. They want us to pay 50-50. And they've kind of got that in trance for now, even for species at risk, they're thinking that a 50-50 split might be fair. And uh, I'm not sure as a producer, I should be putting up 50% when 35 million people in Canada put up the other 50%. Somehow, that just not quite, my numbers don't add up the same way. So, uh, you know, them are some of the challenges that come out of 
down east and uh, they've been to work for you before, so here you go. And so going forward, you know, I think program I'm in, it's, uh, it's fairly uh, cut and dried. You, here's what you need. I guess, you know, a few of the little things that uh, we're kind of working on is we need maps because when Nell comes out or whatever, and they send me a spreadsheet of uh, 18 different transits that they run, same as they do in the park, numbered 1 to 18. Okay, where was she? You know, I can go out. I went out with her a couple of days this year and kind of showed her around, and then I had something to go to, a wedding or something, and uh, come back, okay, how did they number these? And so it's hard for me without that extra information, but there are some things we can work out as, a, as an agency. And uh, so other than that, you know, we spend a week out there down uh, measuring grass and identifying grass and uh, getting sunburnt or froze to death, depending. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's uh, so far been able to hit the targets. Uh, it, you know, the last year was fairly dry, so I'm pretty sure I'm coming down. But I started from a spot with uh, lots of places had too much litter. And uh, I can, my way of controlling the litter is basically to leave the cows there into the winter because every time they stick their nose down through the snow, come up with something, they've got a mustache full of that litter. So they can, you know, and that's weather related, whether I get away with it or not. And, uh, you know, so there were some of the things I, I managing for species at risk through the program, I have to take a little bit more uh, awareness of, be more aware of. And uh, so it's it's a different uh, it's a different scenario I would say. It's not that you can't uh, learn we all know how to graze cows and if we uh, you know if we have to make something look like one of them pictures, it might, like you said, uh, the fellow chasing cows back into that long spur habitat every day because they don't, they don't like it. But uh, that's the, the extra, you know, the extra effort you put into uh, to being part of a program, and that just uh, you're not going to get anything without, you know, doing a little bit of extra work and. Sometimes it's uh, getting the knowledge, sometimes it's uh, getting out there. I don't have cross fences. Uh, when they built the highway, there's a fire come through at the same time. And when it didn't burn down, my father tore out. So I have, you know, good enough topography differences that I can manage without <coughs> fences for the most part and, and uh, stuff. So that <coughs> is just a different. What works for me might not work for everybody, and uh, that's why the you know the program I'm in with the result base doesn't matter really what I do as long as I'm producing them results. I'm uh, you know I'm still within their parameters. I'm meeting the needs of a species. The habitat is there, and so. Uh, yeah, I guess that's uh, overall. It's uh, like I say. Now coming into the this year will be the fourth year. Last year the funding and what the funding looks like down the road is nobody knows. We don't know. So uh, that is one of the downfalls because you manage this way and then okay now. After four years, I kind of got cows used to listening. When I put you here, you stay here. <laughs> there's water, there's grass, you don't need to go over there. And uh, who knows uh, after next year if I'll have to do that or if they just, uh, you know, 
if I start changing and uh, doing things a little bit different for just a cowherd instead of a species of this. But, but overall, it's worked well just because I don't have to fill out a whole bunch of corns. They do. I'm just uh, making sure that uh, the habitat that is needed is there. And so, I don't know. I guess I'll let you just ask questions. And anybody's got any questions? What do you use for water if you can't? My yeah. father built uh, probably 10 dams in Oh, dams the whole water. Yeah. If you don't dig down some places a foot, you're going to lose it. And so some of them in the bottom of the coolies, they, they were built with a little cap and a you know, three yard scraper behind it maybe, but like I say, they were built in the 50s, they're all engineered by P. Up, and, and uh, so they scooped out a little bit on a little hole and used it as a dam bank. They hold, you know, they cover half an acre maybe, but he, you know, he built them strategically around the place and when, you know, it doesn't snow and they don't fill up, I have a spring right basically in the center of the whole pasture that uh, runs year-round. I developed it a few years ago with a cribbing and a hose to a water trough eight feet deep and it runs like it just flows continuously, same as grab the stock and overflow goes back into the creek and uh, it, you know, summer, winter, never ices up. <coughs> But that's when you're going to get some heavy pressure. And of course, down in that valley where the spring is, is also the sagebrush flops and stuff. So, you know, if all the rest of the water holes dried up some year, and it has happened in the 80s for me, I've seen them dry up. But uh, the sage growth, uh, I would never meet the sage growth targets in them years because the cows are going to come there and drink and they're going to beat that grass uh, just by being around there. I dug one dugout two years ago into a spring and uh, that was a bad idea. The water there was getting worse every year because it evaporates every year. It leaves the minerals, concentrates the minerals on me. The, uh, the well I put in is getting better. The water was about 10 feet down and uh, it always used to come to the surface anyway, but I think uh, by not coming through that top 10 feet of soil and picking up all the minerals and alkali and stuff that's there and just going out through that hose, that water is actually not better than what I tested on top of the ground. You know, so put water up in that country is a really precious commodity. Uh, this country too. Uh, <laughs> the other thing, in these dry years, and your pasture health has gone down, what happens to your funding when that happens? Yeah, if you don't meet the targets, you're basically... Uh, it don't, it's you're, not... You're not going to get paid, and we have put in like a drought scenario, but I think that would be a worst case, you know, and you're going to have to be watching pretty close to know if you're, you know, close to that target or, you know, how far you can take it because uh, I think what we've discussed is, you know, moving the cows out, finding a new place for them to keep the habitat targets met which is a pretty drastic move and as I say, you better be watching, you know, you better give yourself a little bit of leeway on the measurements to uh, be able to get it done beforehand because on a really dry year, and a you know, herd of antelope comes through, they could, when you're doing a little bit of pole and it's all dried up 
you know, they could knock enough uh, standing litter out of the road that the pole number is going to shrink on you and stuff. So, you know. There, there is a bit of an active eye club, so isn't there an arm in it? Like, I mean, if you had a hailstorm go through, yeah, I thought I had like, a very small agreement with Krista too. But there is a bit of an active eye thing in there. Hailstorm or so, fire. Or yeah, something that's out of your control, and I, yeah. to some measure, it kind of covers the dry part too. I think yeah. I. But yeah, I'm. I'm not a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, a couple other good points you made aren't. <clears throat> it was about the 50-50 share thing. And I can't agree with you more. Um, for some reason, Ottawa finds a branching farming community that we have too much money and too much time. Um, and I'm wondering whether, is anybody, because all this money comes from one spot, right? ECCC brings all that money here. Has anybody ever went to the Revenue Canada and said, at least the tokens that we're getting for some of these programs? And you said 35 million people want, society wants these programs, that money should be tax free. I get a little bit of a token from them, and I'm going to pay income tax on them. Okay, yeah. it, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be. Like, there should be some more leeway there. I mean, money. like I said, it's, you're either going to take it from Environment Canada, or not give it to our Revenue Canada. So, like, why not make that fit? Years ago, I... Uh sitting around the table on a board and I mentioned that all this uh, environmental money should be tax free and anybody that donates, you know, to the fund should have a tax deduction and that is possible if you go through a whole bunch of hoops to get a, you know, a charitable exemption from Revenue Canada. Well, aren't most groups charitable? Hey? Are, are not most groups charitable? Most are, but you still need a Revenue Canada. Like SideCap doesn't have a Revenue Canada vote. A Revenue Canada charitable number. Oh. So, so we can't give out a receipt to an individual or a corporation or whatever. Or what's coming. But I agree and I said that. But I don't allow that. But, uh, <laughs> oh, it's a lot of different options. And it's hard to put a price on what you guys are doing, right, for the public, and they're doing work on that. There's studies being done on that currently to try and put a price on it, because you're right, in my opinion. Well, I, you know, I, don't, I don't think they appreciate the effort of, like you said, juggling the cattle, sitting down, having a grazing program. There's a lot of things that, like I said, they don't value our time or our efforts or our money. They don't understand it, right? So. Farming over there is completely different than what you're doing here. You can't I've compare got, it. You know, I've got a thousand <clears throat> pictures. I've got a pippet picture. And I've got every time I, you know, as a new flower comes on, I take pictures of it and try and get better at taking pictures of them blowing in the wind and not looking blurry and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But that's all monitoring because you're, you know, that's part of the monitoring is you're out there and all that. If I was monitoring for cows, I'd go and make sure there was enough grass for them to eat and they hadn't overgrazed it and started cleaning all the litter up and there was the water in the, you know, in the water hole and that's all I'd have to do. But now I'm out there, you know, okay, what's this flower? What's this? What's that? There's a lot of, uh, a lot well, of time I can spent. Honestly say I'm, I'm never going to be able to do that. I don't have the time. I just can't help. Yeah. No, and it is a lot of time that they don't <coughs> figure out. Mm -hmm. so. Anyway. Thank you so much, Lauren. Yeah. Great talk. Yeah. when you have someone who has a lifetime of experience who's able to come up and just talk and they don't need fancy pictures or anything like that but just to talk from, from being on the ground and in the field so it's pretty awesome. We've had some really good discussion going on here too as well and um, my organization PCAP we're doing some work just trying to raise awareness with with the public in Saskatchewan about what Prairie is and what ranchers do and all the benefits that come from you know, from the ecosystems that are that are here. So there's lots of work going on by our organization and other ones to try and raise awareness with people about that. 
Um, so our next presenter will be Krista Connick Todd. Um, Krista is a rangeland agrologist with the South of the Divide Conservation Action Plan, which is a stewardship organization working on providing habitat for species at risk in Southwest Saskatchewan. And she has a degree in agriculture from the University of Saskatchewan and ranches with her family just north of Tompkins. So, um, do you need, we need this thing here? Yeah. Oh, we put it in there, didn't we? <coughs> Sorry, I should have got that ready already. My bad. Of course. Here we go. Perfect. So I'll turn it over to Krista. Okay. So I'm here today to talk to you guys about pasture planning specific to the Southwest region. For lots of you, this is not a new topic. Um, but we are going to talk a little bit about range health today. So if you have questions, it's your chance. Um, so the pasture planning is all about setting goals for your operation, uh, inventorying what you have, calculating what you need, and deciding how to get where you want to go. Um, the goals for each operation are unique and individual. So the first question is, what is range health? Um, the first step to inventorying what you have is knowing how healthy your pasture is. The term range health means the ability of a rangeland to perform certain functions. So can it provide a reliable forage source? Can it withstand drought? Can it cycle nutrients? Can it keep the soil stable? And does it provide diversity? Uh, in order to be healthy, all parts uh, of the whole ecosystem must be present and working together. So why is range health important? Um, basically because a healthy pasture provides more grass than an unhealthy one. So this is why we care about range health. <laughs> that would be great, thank you. So there's more, there's four main principles to good grazing management. Um, it's all about balancing. So balance your forage supply and demand, distribute your grazing pressure evenly, defer grazing during sensitive times, and allow